Hi, this is Ron Sipsik, and this is the third segment of a three-part series on the duopoly model. In this particular segment, we're going to summarize what we learned in the first two lessons, and we're going to put the summary in what is called a duopoly payoff matrix. So a payoff matrix is nothing more than a table that shows the, the, the payoffs of the different strategies. Note that what is shown in this table on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis are strategies. To compete is a strategy, to cheat is a strategy, to comply with a, with a collusive arrangement or to collude. These are strategies. <clears throat> Every uh, game theory model is going to outline three pieces. Game theory outlines strategies, rules, and uh, payoffs. So this is a payoff matrix which summarizes the outcomes of the different strategies the firms may take. Now there's only two firms, Firm A, which is shown over here on the left-hand side, the vertical axis, and Firm B, which is shown on the horizontal axis at the top. Notice that um, I've, I've divided the matrix into four boxes, So, and I simply number them clockwise. That's customary when you present this. They could be numbered any way we want to number them, but we just number them. And these are just simply reference numbers. Does, the game does not go one, two, three, four, but these boxes allow us to talk about the game and the movements within the game. Notice up here I've, I've uh, explained each payoff matrix by uh, the number will go in that upper right-hand corner. Again, that's, uh, that's arbitrary. We can number the system however we want. And then below the slash is A's payoffs, and above the slash is B's payoffs. And we're measuring payoffs in terms of total revenue. Okay, The bottom line is total revenue in the business world. And so most payoff matrices that are looking at business payoffs are going to be looking at profit numbers. Okay, now what's inside the box in each case is two payoffs. And we've already walked through these. And so I'm simply going to begin to fill them in. When both firms compete, they break even. And so the payoff in box one, compete, compete, the payoff in box one, uh, the payoffs are zero, zero, which means the industry basically breaks even. Now that gives an impetus uh, or reason uh, for collusion. So what we showed in video one, duopoly model video one, is that firms have an incentive to move from a competing position to a colluding position. When they move to collusion, their payoffs jump. And if you recall in our example, uh, each firm increased its profit by $12,000 by simply working together, fixing the price artificially high, uh, restricting the output, and payoffs jump. Now, this will turn out, this box will turn out to be the optimal box in terms of total profit. So collusion is an optimal outcome, which explains why firms, why firms do it why firms are so tempted to engage in price-fixing arrangements in oligopoly markets. Now, our game then moved, our game moved from one to three, and then it moved to two because firm A, firm A cheated. So when firm A cheated, its payoffs rose to 22,500, but let's recall B's payoffs dropped to a minus 3,000. And I'll put that in brackets as we did before. So when the game moves from 1 to 3 to 2, A's payoffs jump, B's payoffs fall, the cheater wins, the cheated firm loses. Now, if the game uh, goes in a normal pattern, it'll revert back to 1 because once the cheater is discovered, once firm B discovers that it's being cheated upon by firm A, it will cheat, and the game will refer, uh, um, return back to cheat, cheat, which is nothing more than compete, compete. So a normal progression in the game would be 1, 3, 2, 1, or the game could go 1, 3, 4, 1. If B did the cheating, B would get the super payoff, 22,500, and A would be the loser. A would uh, be the one to incur the loss of $3,000. So the game can go 1, 3, 2, 1, 
or the game can go 1, 3, 4, 1. Notice again that box 3 is optimal. This is where uh, industry profits or market profits are maximized. If you add up the profits in either two, a box 2 or a box 4, you see it's considerably less than, uh, than 24,000. This would be 19,500. This would be 19,500. Again, box 2 and box 4 are unstable because uh, one of the firms is being cheated upon, and when it finds out it is being cheated upon, then the game will revert back to box 1. So it's important to note that while box 1 is the least optimal box, it's, it's what we would call suboptimal, it's a suboptimal solution, um, it is stable. It is probably what we would call equilibrium because these games, these games are unstable because of cheating behavior. Again, what brings the firms together? Greed. What drives them apart? Greed. So if, if these um, arrangements are, are naturally unstable, the game, even though the game will move from one to three quite, quite often because there can be such a significant improvement in payoffs, the game will revert back to one once this cheating behavior starts. So box three is optimal, but it's probably a disequilibrium outcome. It's, it's not going to be a stable outcome. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So this is our duopoly payoff matrix. And it's, it's basically like a scorecard. It allows us to summarize, to summarize the outcomes. Again, the, uh, the strategies are shown on the axes, on the vertical axes and horizontal axes. We have strategies. And then within each of the boxes, we have payoffs. OK. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to draw a couple final conclusions from this, from this payoff matrix. So, so we'll move down below the payoff matrix and uh, write out a couple more interesting, hopefully interesting ideas and, and summarize the game. Hasn't this been thrilling? What a thrilling model. This is a very cool model. It, it, it's very simple, but it explains a lot of what goes on in the world of oligopoly and uh, cartels and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's just summarize here. So here's box one. The game goes from box one to box what? To box three. Then the game goes from either box three to box two, that is if A cheats in our game, or the game could go to box four if B cheats, and then the game reverts back to box one when the cheater is discovered, and it's back to compete. So box one is uh, the compete scenario. Box two is the collude scenario. Two or four is the cheat scenario. Box one is back to the compete scenario. Okay, so there's a there's a movement in the game. And again, one is one is where the game starts and ends, so that's an equilibrium outcome. And three is optimal, but it's not an equilibrium outcome. All right. Now I want to I want to address one one other thing here before we start to wrap this up. When we move from competition towards collusion, let's, let's remember what happens. The prices go where? Prices go up. In our example, prices went from what? 10 to 20. And what happens? The quantity demanded. I'll use different colors here. I might as well show off my color palette. The quantity demanded goes down. So when we move from compete to collude, we see prices rising from 10 to 20 we see the output rate dropping from what? 9,000 down to 6,000. Now, when the game moves from collude to cheat, the game starts to fall apart. So we're moving back towards compete. Notice we're moving back towards one. It's a two-step process. What happens when we move from collude to cheat? Well, the price what? The price decreases. And what happens? The quantity increases. So remember, in our example, the price went down from 20 to 15. The quantity demanded went from where? Went from 6,000 up to 7,500. 
And then, of course, the last step in the game would be once the cheater is caught, they're both cheating or they're both competing, the price falls back to where it was in the first place. So once again, we get a drop in price, an increase in the quantity demanded, and we're back to the original solution. So there's, a, there's an important principle here. There's, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a principle to pull out of this. This is a principles lesson. When we move from competition towards collusion, prices rise, output rates drop. When we move from collusion back towards uh, competition, what happens? Prices fall and output rates rise. We can see here why the government has an incentive to, uh, to prevent this sort of thing from going on. There's a transfer of wealth from what? From consumers to producers. Let me go ahead. I've got a little bit of time and space remaining, so let me, let me go ahead and remind you of this. This is a very important idea. So we'll go ahead and we'll scroll. We'll go ahead and scroll up. And I'm going to, this is a model you've seen before if you've been following my videos or seen me lecture this in class. So here's the demand curve. We have not moved the demand curve this entire, uh, this entire series. The demand relationship has remained constant. Here's the, here's the supply curve. And here's the MR curve. Okay. And let me go ahead and label this up. This is going to be dollars. This is going to be Q. This is going to be S or MC. If we're talking uh, a competitive market, it's supply. If we're talking monopoly, it's MC. Here's the demand curve. Here's the marginal revenue curve. And then remember what we've said, if supply equals demand, where's the price? The price is 10. And I'm going to move up here a little bit. And the quantity, read down here, uh, the quantity is 9,000. We can do that a little bit better. Quantity is 9,000. Okay. And, of course, that's not where the, the game operates or where we operate if there's collusion. If there's collusion, we operate here where MC equals MR. And notice this is the quantity QM where we're at 6,000, right? And we read up, and we read over, and this is P equals 20, right? So collusion drives the price higher, and collusion drives the output rate lower. And again, this is what we call price fixing here, price fixing. Two, firm, two or more firms holding the price artificially high. Now, I want to show you something. I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to, let's just ignore the MR curve here. I'm going to shade this area right here. I'm going to call this area A. I'm going to call this area here B. I'm going to call this area here C. I'm going to call this area here D. So it looks like this. You can ignore the, ignore the MR curve. And then this area here, this little triangle here, is going to be E. Now, you've seen this before. Uh, this shouldn't be much of a surprise to you. I'm going to try to draw this right over here. So we set up a uh, matrix, another matrix, another table. 
and this will be consumer surplus, producer surplus, societal surplus, this is competition, this is collusion. Okay, collusion is monopoly. And let's go ahead and what's what's consumer surplus if they're if they're, if we just have a competitive outcome, it's areas A, B, and C. It's above the price line. Again, you can just forget this, forget this MR curve right now. You can just get rid of that. You don't need to get rid of yours, but in terms of looking at this, we can just forget that. Get rid of that. I'm just gonna get it out of there so it's not confusing us. And where where is consumer surplus? It's A, B, and C. So A, B, C. That's producer surplus below the price line above the supply curve. D and E. Societal surplus is A through E. Okay. Now, if the price jumps to 20 and the output rate drops to 6,000, what do consumers get? Consumers get A. So consumers lose what? B and C. Consumers lose. So cartelization, monopolization, hurts consumers. How do, produ how do the two producers come out? Well, their price is now what? 20. And we're only producing out to 6,000. So producers get below the price line, above the supply curve, out to 6,000. Producers get what? B and D. So producers pick up B, lose E. B is greater than E. Again, you've seen this. So the two producers win by, cart by cartelizing. Society ends up with A, B, and D. Society loses what? Society loses C and E. So society loses, and this is the deadweight loss. So this area right here, I'll go ahead and shade it all in, is what we call the deadweight loss. This is loss. Loss of what? Loss of societal welfare. Again, it's the the uh, the saying is the sin of underproduction. All right. So this is your this is your dead weight loss. Okay. And so we can again see that the government has an interest in preventing monopolization, even when the firms keep their separate identity. You have two different firms, firm A and firm B. When they behave as one firm, uh, you basically have monopoly. And you can see that the, the bottom line to remember with this is that there's a loss of welfare. There's a direct wealth transfer from whom? From consumers to producers. So what the government is trying to do here is protect consumers uh, from, losing, from losing. And you can actually calculate the size of, of B there. Uh, in fact, you can you could calculate the areas of all these. We can actually calculate the size of that. That that area B is a is a fairly large chunk of money. It's coming right out of the pockets of consumers. Here's B. What's the width of that? The width of that is of that box. The width of that is ten. And what's the length of that box? The length of that box is six thousand. So that's that that box alone, which is area B. The area of that box is sixty thousand. That's a sixty thousand dollar wealth transfer from whom? From consumers to producers. And the government is trying to prevent that from happening using what are called antitrust laws. All right. Well, that concludes our our lesson uh, in duopoly. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, there's really nothing more that I that, that I want to add at this point. We've gone on long enough, so we'll conclude.